A lot of strange things are happening in the Philippines lately. This South China Sea issue has been going on for a while now. And now, out of the blue, European countries are paying attention to the Philippines. Even UN agencies are showing sudden interest in the country. I wonder why. For example, a representative from the United Nations, Irene Khan, decided to focus on the Philippines instead of looking at countries in Africa or the Middle East. She visited the Philippines and people started talking about human rights problems in the country. Then there is the focus on modernizing the Philippine military. The most unusual recent development is the proposal to separate Mindanao from the Philippines, suggested by former President Duterte. The sudden shift raises questions. It seems like Duterte might be aware of something that prompted him to suggest the separation of Mindanao from the rest of the Philippines. What could be the reason behind this sudden change? Some people think that China might be involved in this situation. They believe this because the Philippine media, influenced by the United States, keep talking about it. The basic idea is simple, to make China, their big rival, look bad globally. This strategy has been used before, like with Cuba, where countries not doing what the United States wants are made to look bad and aggressive. But if you do what America says, you won't be criticized. Instead, you will be praised and even hailed as a hero. For instance, when President Duterte decided to distance himself from America and pursue an independent foreign policy, it was seen as negative by America. As a result, he was portrayed negatively, labeled as a womanizer puppet, and more. Ferdinand Marcos experienced a similar situation, or even worse. He was removed from power because he insisted that America should pay rent for using military bases. In fact, he demanded nearly $200 million from America. Now let's briefly touch on each topic. Why is the Philippines becoming more focused on the military all of a sudden? And why is the government putting more effort into upgrading the military instead of dealing with problems like agriculture, inflation, and education? The Philippines is not fighting with other countries right now. So there must be some other reason why they suddenly want to make their military stronger. What about the ICC? Why is it focused on the Philippines now? Anyone who has a background about the history of the ICC knows too well that it's, it's a joke. Is it just a coincidence that there is a push to upgrade the military capability right after granting America access to new military bases? How about the separation of Mindanao? Is it related to all of that? If so, how? What about the media? Does the media have a role in all of this? Now let's talk about upgrading the Philippine military capabilities. The Philippines is planning to upgrade the Air Force and Navy by getting more advanced fighter jets and other aircraft to patrol with naval ships. In the 2024 national budget, the Philippines decided to use a lot of money from confidential funds, which were initially requested by the Department of Education and other government offices. They shifted this money to the Philippine Coast Guard. The past president, Duterte, wanted to make the military stronger. Why? Because there was a real danger from rebels in Mindanao. But now, without any actual threat, the focus on building up the navy seems questionable. Because there are no rebels in the waters around the Philippines. If there is no real danger, then they must be created to justify spending money on the military instead of using it for important things like education and agriculture. So how do they create a threat? The media. The media comes in. Creating a threat involves the media. The Philippine media follows the lead of the Western media. As the Western media, aims to wage a propaganda war against any country 
that doesn't comply with its agenda. To make Filipinos scared and support spending money on the military instead of important areas like farming, the media must always show China as a big threat. But the truth is, there is no real danger. No Filipino Coast Guard has ever been shot. In Mindanao, rebels freely go into people's houses and steal their things. Vietnam is actually far more dangerous, but we'll look at that later. If the media did its duty in keeping people informed about important matters in the Philippines, they could have covered the events in Mindanao or the clash between the Philippines and Vietnamese Coast Guards. However, since that doesn't align with any specific agenda, meaning it doesn't benefit the United States in any way, it gets ignored. No one talks about it. Here's another example. Vietnam consistently makes problems with the Philippine Coast Guard. They always make trouble with the Philippine Coast Guard. But the media doesn't report it. Why? Simple. Demonizing or making Vietnam look bad does not serve any purpose or America because Vietnam is not a superpower. Did you know that Vietnam tricked the Philippines and literally took an entire island that belonged to the Philippines? I'm sure you don't know that. Why? Because it was never reported in the media. Vietnam is the only country that took an island in the spotlights that belonged to the Philippines. But they did it by tricking Filipino Coast Guards. In 1975, South Vietnam used a clever but deceitful plan to take Pogad Island, or South K, from the Philippines, which had been there since 1968. The Vietnamese soldiers on a nearby island invited the Filipino troops commanding officer in Pogad to a birthday party on another island. They even mentioned having dancers from Saigon for entertainment. The Filipino troops, trusting the Vietnamese due to the Philippines' support in their war against the Communist North, left Pugad for the celebration. Fortunately, when they returned the next day, Vietnamese troops were in trenches with machine guns, ordering them to leave. Vietnam had brought in more troops during the night to secure Pugad and has held the island since. They constructed a large facility on the island. Pogad is the fourth largest islet in the Spartleys. To truly instill fear, the media must repeatedly discuss the same topic, even magnifying a minor incident to make it seem like a big problem. Now let's talk about the ICC and Duterte, how it's all connected. Duterte strongly criticized America and aimed for an independent foreign policy. And that's a big mistake. Refusing to comply with the master led to media vilification. Meaning Duterte criticized America a lot and wanted his own foreign policy, which turned out to be a big mistake. Why? Not following what the United States wanted led the media saying bad things about him. Instead, he chose to deal with America's enemies. If Duterte acted like a puppet of America, he would not have been criticized. Duterte also warned about ending the Visiting Forces Agreement, or VFA, a deal that permitted America to keep a military presence in Asia. Once more, you don't challenge the master like that. So the media campaign to vilify Duterte intensified even more. The usual media propaganda targeted Duterte, labeling him as a puppet of China. However, it raises the question of why being associated with China is considered a taboo, when the president of South Korea is seen as a puppet of America, yet it isn't viewed the same way. This shows why it's important to make China look bad. If a future independent president like Duterte chooses his own foreign policy, Linking him to the negative image created by the media about China becomes easier. So it's easy to say, oh, look, he's a Chinese puppet because China is bad. Here's a simple example to help you better understand my point. Imagine you don't like your neighbor because his house is nicer and better and more beautiful. 
and they are gaining more influence, they have more friends. You feel envious because you can't replicate what they have done. For example, you cannot build a beautiful house. But since you've been in the neighborhood longer, you can match your neighbor's success. What do you do? You start spreading false rumors about them to make them look bad. As time passes, the gossip goes all around the neighborhood, and your one successful neighbor is now thought of as the troublesome one. Some people are cautious about being linked with them. It's a significant setback for the US and its former colony, no longer wants to be a puppet state. Therefore, they must shift the blame to a created enemy. This is not new, it has always been the case in many countries especially the ones that are not allied with America. The Philippines was not doing well under the Aquino government, and it's crucial to mention that it still behaved like a puppet state. It followed what America said. But did the Philippines gain anything? The country did not gain any advantage, and that's exactly what you would predict. When a country stays poor, it becomes easier to control. President Aquino III has not kept his promises to punish the security forces for serious human rights abuses. Since he started his term, Human Rights Watch reports that not a single case of unlawful killing or forced disappearance, even those happening during his presidency, has been successfully prosecuted by the Aquino government. This hasn't been reported in the media. Why? Because he was a US puppet. Have you even heard of the name ICC during the Aquino's term? Even though there were numerous human rights abuses? No. Now let's talk about the ICC. The ICC specializes in arresting and prosecuting mainly African leaders, not following the West's path. Has been primarily funded by the EU since its establishment in 2002. In 2020, Germany, France, Japan, and the UK were the main contributors. The ICC tends to comply with EU requests, which means they don't have any independence or self-esteem. Other than the EU, some allies like Japan and group of African countries pushed by the EU, no country with self-respect has joined the ICC. Not China, Ethiopia, India, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt, or even the US, whose allies established the ICC. In 2002, when the ICC was established, the US Congress passed the American Service Members Protection Act. This law prevented financial aid to any ICC member country that might want to surrender US personnel to the court. It also gave the US the right to use force to rescue any American help by the ICC. The US compelled many countries to sign agreements stating that they would not hand over any American to the ICC. Realizing that the ICC mainly serves new colonial interests, the African Union urged the 34 African countries to sign up with the ICC to collectively withdraw on June 31, 2017. Now that we've established that the ICC is a joke, why are they targeting Duterte? Simple, Duterte is outspoken just like the African president. He doesn't keep quiet and that's not favorable for America. You don't defy the master. The US prefers leaders who align with his interests. In this situation, isolating its major competitor in Asia. Same thing happened in Latin America and Eastern Europe. Same scenario played out. Now let's talk about the separation of Mindanao. To understand why the vast majority of people in Mindanao seek separation, you need to understand how Mindanao is the way it is today. And the reason why Mindanao is important to me, because my wife is from Mindanao. Mindanao, the second largest island in the Philippines after Luzon, and seventh most populous island in the world, located in the southern region of the archipelago. The island is part of an island group of the same name that also includes its adjacent islands namely the Sulu Archipelago. In the Treaty of Paris in 1898, Spain sold the entire Philippine archipelago to the United States for $20 million. In the early 1900s, 
The Commonwealth government, led by Americans, encouraged citizens from Luzon and Visayas to migrate to Mindanao, consisting mostly of Ilocanos, Cebuanos, and Ilongos. Mindanao was peaceful and increasingly progressive in the post-war period, post-Japan-Philippine War period, including the 1950s and 60s. Ethnic tensions were minimal, and there was essentially no presence of secessionist groups in Mindanao. Under Ferdinand Marcos's administration, Christian groups began to settle in Mindanao, displacing many locals. The population boom resulted in conflicts, as the original owners sought their ancestral land domains. The Marcos administration encouraged new settlers who had emigrated to Mindanao to form a militia, which was eventually called the Ilaga. Anecdotal evidence states that the Ilaga often committed human rights abuses by targeting the Moro and Lumad people, as well as attempting to seize additional territory. It resulted in a lingering animosity between Moro and Christian communities. Mistrust and a cycle of violence are still felt today due to the creation of the Ilaga. The Jabida massacre in 1968 is often pointed to as the main trigger for the Moro insurgency. The resulting ethnic tensions gave rise to secessionist movements like the Muslim independence movement and the Bangsamoro Liberation Organization. Additionally, a financial crisis in late 1969 led to social unrest across the country. Harsh crackdowns on protests resulted in the radicalization of many students. Some of them joined the New People's Army, bringing the rebellion to Mindanao for the first time. Mindanao's economy accounts for 14% of the country's GDP. Agriculture, forestry, and fishing make up more than 40% of Mindanao's market. Being the country's largest supplier of major crops, such as pineapples and bananas. The core issue in Mindanao is not about ethnicity or religion, but economics. If Mindanao was well developed and prosperous, there wouldn't be a need for rebellion. To conclude this video, let me include a quote or a comment from a Mindanaoan and how they feel about the separation of Mindanao. She writes, I'm from Mindanao, living in Cotabato city. I'm born Muslim and I'm Moro. For me, firstly, I think I must learn the differences between the word Muslim and Islam. If we say Muslim, these are the people who follow religion Islam. And when we say Islam, this is the religion brought by Prophet Muhammad and derived from the word Salam. Living in the Philippines and being a Moro is a bit hard. That's because we face different problems like discriminations or being a Muslim, unfair treatment and unequal justice, etc. As a Moro from Mindanao, I had no intentions or even the Moro and the whole Mindanao for any separation of the Philippine archipelago. As a Moro, what we only want is the right to have self-determination and equal justice. For me, self-determination in a sense that we want to be recognized that we are also part of the Philippines. We should be treated equally and with equal justice. There is always, I think, this mindset of some people that people from Mindanao, like the Moro people, would want the Mindanao to secede from the Philippines. Personally, I can't blame them for having this mindset. It's because some of them would probably don't understand the situations in Mindanao. All of the happenings in Mindanao and up to this secede issue, it all started from the massacre called the Bida Massacre. The Bida Massacre was the killing of Moro, soldiers by members of the armed forces of the Philippines on March 18, 1968. After this incident happened, there were more massacres among Moro people and justice was not given. They were being killed for no apparent reason. Living in Mindanao is not that easy. Even since then, we never attained the peace we always wanted. Luckily, people in Luzon and Visayas can easily go to school, go to markets and buy some stuffs in the malls and can easily access everything. But in Mindanao, it's the opposite. There is poor education not because the local government are not doing something, but because these areas were a war zone areas. What we want is self-determination, equal treatment, justice, equal rights. I'll say respect for who we are, for the culture we have, and for the beliefs we have. 
and most importantly, is the peace and unity among the people of the Philippines.